on the investment. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. I, I don't I don't see this any other way. I mean, I know you're trying to be more conservative with your numbers, but um, I mean, I see this as literally like infinity investment. Um, yeah. <laughs> unless, yes. you have, unless, you, unless you have another plan for evolving taxes. So who are you guys? What, what the heck are you guys doing? Where are you from? <laughs> yeah, so uh, ARC is American Revitalization Company, and our focus um, was born out of the omnibus bill. So our team has been in the conservation easement space now for the better part of a decade, um, put together close to 30 different projects on tracts of land that were conserved in that space. And... Um, you may not know this, but um, the tax laws around um, the charitable deductions that people get for conserving land or historic buildings is the same tax code. And uh, so back, you know, going back to 16, the IRS started challenging these conservations or preservations on historic buildings. It didn't matter if it was a historic building or raw land that was being conserved. The IRS didn't like it if um, unrelated parties got together and started doing this. So they, they, they put together what's called a listing notice, and they started attacking every one of these transactions, auditing them, tying people up in court, and just making it generally undesirable to be in that space or, you know, doing their best to do so. Um, and then, you know, through kind of some different iterations, um, a couple of different bills were proposed and then you know finally they they passed a, a bipartisan piece in the uh, omnibus bill at the end of last year that kind of changed the the landscape quite a bit they took away the the ability for you and i let's say to go do a conservation easement together and they put all these kind of guardrails around the multiples um you know so if i invest a dollar you know I can legally only take a $2.50 tax deduction now. And whereas in the past, it was solely based on what we could value that land at. So we look at things through the eyes of a developer, right? If I take a piece of land, whether it's a building in Lancaster or a hundred acres of farmland out in, in, in rural North Carolina, you know, what, what's the highest and best use for that land? What can I do with it? Right. And that's, that's how the, the, the government looks at it. You know, when you go to court and, and you defend these things, it, it's always going to come down to that valuation. If if I'm saying, <clears throat> you know, I'm going to take a thousand acres in the desert of Nevada and I'm going to build Disneyland on it, yeah, probably not realistic, right? But so so there's some guardrails to kind of how this all works and and kind of the the court um, cases and and precedent that's been established. And as long as you stay within that, it, it's generally been you know fairly straightforward, and you don't have a whole lot to worry about. Um, you know, in, in fact, the treasury actually was the one that stepped in at the end of the year and, and said, Hey, you know, not only has the IRS been abusive with their attacks of these things, but they didn't even follow the administrative procedures act when they put this listing notice in place. So it was actually thrown out by the treasury courts. So, so that kind of opened up, you know, the doors once we got rid of that, cause that's what CPAs hated about it is, is they can't recommend a, a listed transaction to their clients. Cause it was a little too risky for them. And then the second part of what happened was the omnibus bill. And what the omnibus bill did is it put all these guardrails and, and, and limitations in place on conserving open space or green land, but they specifically carved out and set aside historical buildings and said, we're not affecting the law on this at all. And we're not changing it whatsoever. So all these new rules don't apply to historic buildings. And so based on that, we, we made a clear decision, you know, that, that that was the direction we wanted to head because we, we see better, you know, better economics there on the historical side. And, you know, quite frankly, I mean, you know, uh, raw land is getting harder and harder to come by these days. And uh, so, so a lot of the land that can be conserved has been conserved. And, and so um, that's kind of how we shifted and created ARC. Um, and, you know, the focus is, 
you know, we have to take these historic buildings. We have to determine what the highest and best use, what, you know, what could you develop on this, whether, whether it's knocking the building down or building on top of it, um, you know, building around it. And you got to come up with what that value would be just like a developer would do. And, um, and, and then based on whatever the, the lost opportunity is for, for that project, um, that's what our investors tax deduction is based on. So, Hypothetically, if, if a building would value out at $100 million once it was stabilized and it would cost me $50 million to build it, well, my, my investors would receive a $50 million tax deduction. And that's probably not far off of what the Lancaster project looks like fundamentally, um, just because Lancaster is a booming you know, retirement community. There's also something to be said for it's neat to be able to work with these old historic buildings. Like, you know, the building that we're talking about in Lancaster, I'm sure you've driven by it. It's these beautiful old buildings that we're getting the chance to preserve uh, and really work and, with. And just, and so it's, a, it's, a, it's a post office building, the old, the old post office building. In right. 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 Pennsylvania. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It, it, it's an old, you know, 65,000, 70,000 square foot granite building, beautiful architecture, you know, um, you, you know, an asset that likely would you know, wouldn't make it in kind of the modern world if it wasn't protected. And so by permanently putting a deed of preservation on that building, the facade of that building can never be altered. We just look at what's, what's the cost to take this property from where it is today to that, right? That 30 story luxury high rise senior living, right? What does it cost me to get there? And then we do market studies and we have third party appraisers that come in and say, well, if you built this, this is what it's going to value at. Here's the comps. Here's the discounted cash flow model on the valuations, and yeah. and they just back into the numbers. And and so between you know between all of our costs and, and the purchase of the building, we're probably going to be all in around ten million, and we expect that to generate anywhere between a twenty five and forty million dollar tax deduction to our investors. How now that tax deduction uh, would offset other passive gains, or I guess if you're a real estate investor could offset W-2 uh, income, but if you're just a W-2. Well, uh, here's, here's the great thing about it. Because of the, 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 the section of the tax code that this is in, it's actually classified as a charitable deduction. So anybody can invest in our fund and get mm-hmm. a charitable deduction that will offset up to 50% of their AGI. So most charitable deductions are limited to 30% of your AGI. And this section of the tax code allows it for 50%. And the other thing that's unique about this part of the tax code is it actually allows the carry forward for 15 years instead of five. So we can offset all forms of income. A lot of our investors are, you know, W-2 tech workers from Silicon Valley and things of that nature. Um, We do get a lot of entrepreneurs that that, that invest as well. And, um, you know, but, but the, the perfect utilization of the, of, of the fund is somebody who has a perfect blend of ordinary income and capital gains income because charitable deductions offset your highest taxable income first. So if I got a guy that's got a half a million of ordinary and a half a million of capital gains, right, we're going to be able to offset all of his ordinary income at the higher rate, and he's only going to pay taxes on the half a million of capital gains. So just to round out the example, I think I got my head around it. So I put in 100K into your fund. It's not crazy for me to expect a 250K tax write-off, which could go against my highest uh, taxable income. If I'm making 500K a year, you know, I can I can write 250K off. My tax savings on that's going to be about 100K, give or take what state you live in. Yep. Uh, uh, and so I'm basically in the investment for free. Exactly. Yeah, and it's it's, the- it's kind of, it's kind of the found money concept, right? We're taking mm-hmm. your tax dollars and we're buying you know income producing assets, and we we are going to cap that deduction at two dollars and fifty cents to every dollar uh, uh, invested, just because you know legally there's no requirement to do that. Um, the the code allows us to to take the full value of any of these appraised you know uh, valuations, but we we you know, the IRS has been very vocal and very clear that if you stay at or below that threshold, they're not going to harass you. And they've even made motions to dismiss in court around that. So we feel pretty good that um, by staying under that $2.50 or, or two and a half multiple on your tax deductions, 
that, that it's going to really lower the, the risk profile from an audit perspective with the IRS. And that's what most of our CPAs and investors are looking for, right? They're looking for something that they can feel comfortable about recommending to their clients. That's great. So then, and then as I understand this right, you have to hold the asset for five years. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, so after five years, you would probably sell the property. That's right. Yeah. So, so the fund will have about a five and a half year uh, life. Um, we will liquidate all the holdings, uh, the real estate and the businesses will get liquidated um, at the you know, beginning of the five year period. And so, um, the, you know, the idea here is that we, we will generate a preferred return. So the fund is structured with a 7% cumulative preferred return to the investors before the 80-20 split of the profits. Um, and, and that's 80% to the investors and 20% to the manager. Yeah, super fair. And then um, once, once we return, not counting any tax benefits, but once we return 100% of your invested capital, it flips to 80-20 manager. So... Our incentive and our focus is on the back end. If we don't perform and execute on the assets, you know, we're not going to make a lot of money. But if, if we do perform and execute, then it's, it's going to be about a 50-50 split over the life of the fund between the investors and the manager. And, and I mean, it's weird. Normally, you do like an expected IRR. I guess without tax benefits, your expected IRR is probably okay. 9%, yeah. something like that, but kind of what you're telling me, if I'm doing the math yeah. right. Um, but then you're like, with your tax benefits, the IRR goes to like blank over zero, which you can't even do. It's like, a, it, it's infinity. I mean, you, you probably can't calculate the IRR. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's in the upper 40s. Yeah, so, so, so high single digits, low double digits without the tax benefits. And then when you add them in, it's it's definitely up in that, that you know, high 40s. But, but I mean... I'm not crazy to think that if you're getting that tax deduction year one, you put in a hundred, you get a 250 K tax deduction. As I see it, that was money going to the IRS. As I see that like the opportunity is, cost is paying taxes on the investment. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. I don't, I don't see this any other way. I mean, I know you're trying to be more conservative with your numbers, but um, I mean, I see this as literally like infinity investment. Um, yeah. <laughs> unless, yes. you another, yes. unless you have another plan for evolving taxes. This is really I'm glad I'm glad you see it that way. And one of the really interesting aspects of this, Chad, is that if you're an entrepreneur, right, if you're running your own business, you're typically paying quarterly estimated taxes. So I can make this investment in January, February, March and have my CPA alter my quarterly estimates based on the charitable deduction. So I don't even have to wait, you know, 12 months to, to, to recover this from the IRS like a W-2 employee would. I Absolutely. can actually I can have an immediate equalization yeah. of my tax payments. That's great. Our, our investment minimums, 100K, have to be an accredited investor. Um, so, so those are really the qualifications. Um, and, and, you know, our average ticket right now is about 250, 275 grand. Okay. And how big of a fund are you guys raising? So uh, we, we legally set the limit of the fund at 100 million. Um, however, we, we think we're probably with, with the three assets that we have under contract, we're probably targeting about a $40 million raise. And we're probably about 10 to 15% into that right now. And then like the idea is to raise it all this year? Is that what you're trying to do? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It has to all be done in a, in a calendar year. Um, we have to shut off the fundraising probably by the end of, you know, middle to end of October, um, maybe into the first couple of weeks in November um, in order to close all the assets and file the deed of preservation in, in this calendar year for the tax benefits. Cool. And you guys are based in Missouri? Is that <clears throat> no. So the headquarters is in Nashville. Nashville. Um, my partners are all based out of Birmingham, Alabama. Um, we have, uh, you know, a couple people up in the Nashville area, northern Northern Alabama, southern Tennessee, and then I'm actually out in the Bay Area in, in, in California. We host an event here in Lancaster for real estate investors. We get about 100 people to come out. Um, when you're in town, at some point, someone who's like a partner or, or yeah, who knows they're talking about. We should have you. I can tell you the dates. We should definitely have you come speak. At the That'd be event. great. Would love to. Um, it's like a super innovative. Um, I mean, you're the first person. I mean, I know a lot about tax deductions. This historic tax credit definitely went under the radar. I mean, I don't really know anyone talking about it. Um, yeah. It seems like when we're at some point, this is going to increase the value of those assets because 
Uh, but yeah, and there and there's a lot of ways to skin the cat, Chad. We we don't have to buy an asset outright, so we can even partner with a lot of your your listeners and members. And you know, we have developers that are you know we're we're buying the air rights to preserve the building, so we we buy the development rights um, to the building, just just like people would in New York City or Miami, right? You can sell your development rights off. And um, so we can buy that and you can maintain or your client or listener can maintain ownership of the asset and, and they just give up those development rights in the future. And, and so we can work deals out that way. Um, you know, we have a, a couple of folks right now looking at doing a 1031 um, into a, a historic asset where, you know, they would hold it for the year in the day holding period and then do the charitable, they would do the deed of preservation next year, right? So you got a guy who's doing a 1031 on a building, but he's got a substantial taxable income, you know, we can take a tax deduction for him in, you know, after a year and a day. And so there's a lot of different ways to, to kind of utilize this tool. We have CPAs using it for Roth conversions with clients, um, you know, dealing with RSUs and stock options and things like that. So there's a lot of different ways to utilize the fund. So like you could go into someone who owns a building that's historic and say, hey, we'll, we'll buy your air rights. You don't even own the building. Yeah. Do, do nothing with the air rights. And then use the air rights as a tax write-off, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So basically everything is still the same. We still do all the same due diligence, same, you know, project management to, to make sure we, we, we validate what the tax deduction is, but we, we, we don't actually have to own the asset. We, we, right. we prefer to, but we don't have to. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and so we can, we can come up with a structure where the, the property owner gets a capital infusion, which they do whatever they want with it. A lot of them, a lot of the guys that we're talking to are doing the actual renovations of these historic assets. So they need a bridge loan, which they typically go to a bank and pay a high interest rate on to do the construction before they can capture the, the historical tax credits coming back from the federal and state um, programs. So if we can do a, an air rights deal and, 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 and permanently preserve that historic building, we'll give them it, the money. <laughs> it, it, exactly. So we become their bridge loan and they don't pay interest. They love it. And, and the other thing you're doing is, uh, you know, the, the state historic preservation offices love it too, because now they're locking in that building. They're getting the historic renovation on the building and they're getting the historic deed of preservation on the building. So they for know- five years, is it locked in or it's locked in longer? It's locked in for so, so with with the renovation credits, it's locked in for five years, but when you do the deed of preservation, that building's permanently protected. So, so like, like the building you're doing in Lancaster, will that building be permanently protected? Correct, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're, we're buying that whole asset. We're gonna own the asset. Our investors will, will, will participate in that asset and we will permanently protect that building so it'll never be changed. When you sell it in five and a half years, it will sell as a historic building that must stay within this, this yep. use. No one can It'll it. always be the 70,000 you know, footprint envelope that it is today. You'll never be able to change the, the, the exterior facade of the building. You can do whatever you want to the interior. You can change uses of the interior. You're just not going to be permitted to destroy the, the architectural you know, character of the building. Yeah, super cool, Steve. Are there a bunch of folks like you out there right now, or are you guys like one of the few? No, there, there, there's really nobody that, that that we see out there kind of doing what we are doing. Uh, I'm sure there are some people doing it. We we just haven't run run across them yet. And uh, you, you know, at the end of the day, we we feel like we have a really unique strategy, and and we're only talking about the real estate side. There's there's a whole you know manufacturing play where where we take all the excess cash because we're capping those taxes deductions at two and a half to one, whatever excess cash is left over after all the real estate is done at the end of the year, we're going to go out and buy some, some legacy, you know, industrial manufacturing companies and help, you know, maintain those jobs here in the United States, make sure they're not going overseas and, and help rebuild the American manufacturing sector. And, and so that's going to create another tax play on the, on the exit of the fund as well. I'm curious, what, what constitutes a historic building? What's the... When it comes to our program doing the preservation, the deed of preservation, um, the, the thing that constitutes historic building is that it's already on the National Park Service's registry. So it can be individually protected or it can be part of a, a listed historic district on the registry as a contributing property. And ultimately, the, <clears throat> the Park Service has four criteria to determine you know, if a building is qualified. 
Um, it, it, you know, the, the, the preliminary is it has to be at least 50 years old, right? And then they look at the materials and the architecture. Um, they look at, um, you know, is there any kind of event-driven historical significance to the building? Um, they look at, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, historical figures, right? You know, did Thomas Jefferson, you know, have lunch at this building every Tuesday for, for you know, most of his life or something to that, you know, was a famous treaty or, or something signed at this building, right? So those are the primary three that get most assets onto the registry. The fourth is archaeological. And so obviously we stay away from archaeological for obvious reasons because you can't really alter those sites. And generally speaking, if you can add 100 to 150,000 square feet to the current building, it, it's generally it's going to pencil out for our investors. So, so that's kind of our initial litmus test, if you would. Is, uh, do you have a hard time explaining this to high net worth individuals who don't? Understand? Not really. No, no. I mean, you know, most people get it pretty quickly that, it, that it's kind of the found money concept that, that you're kind of trading tax dollars for, you know, performing assets and, you know, and, and you know, whether whether or not you believe in kind of the mission of, of preserving these kind of historic downtowns and these, you know, kind of legacy manufacturing companies, you know, people generally agree with that thesis regardless of kind of your political beliefs they, they kind of agree with kind of preserving you know these parts of america um but but you, you know people love the, the 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 tax benefits initially but then they they really dig in you know what we've seen is they really tend to dig into kind of the the nature of what we're doing and why we're doing it and and, and that really kind of gets people on board pretty quickly are you able to add stuff to the this registry or is that like impossible like you said. Oh, no, yeah. You, and anybody can add properties. There's currently about 1.8 million properties uh, nationwide on the registry. And, you know, um, I'll give you an example. We found a really good asset down in, in Miami, right? Right. Kind of in the downtown sector of Miami. And it, it's it's a historic building at the local level. It's just never been placed on the registry. Um, so so we'll work with a partner to, to go through the process. It takes anywhere from three to six months to get a building on the registry. So really awesome. We haven't talked too much about the manufacturing side. Maybe just comments a little deeper on that. So this is like more on the tail end of the, the fund. You're looking to actually go buy manufacturing plants that are that are distressed. Do I have that right? Not distressed. So we're really looking for, you know, your typical baby boomer, somebody who doesn't have a succession plan in place. And, um, you know, they haven't shut the business down because it's a vital business to their community. They, they, they have a lot of long term employees. Um, you know, it's not uncommon to see, you know, employees that have been with them for 10, 15, 20 years. And, um, you know, they they live, you know, they've made their money. They're, they're quasi retired. They're kind of semi remotely running the businesses. They just don't want to lay off their people. And, and so there's a lot of those stories out there throughout America right now. And, you know, I was lucky to be part of a, you know, kind of a traditional private equity roll up fund going out and acquiring those businesses. So I saw, you know, I sat in the rooms with these guys and I, I heard their stories and they're just incredible, you know, incredible businesses that um, have been very profitable, very successful. And the reason we like them is, um, you know, there are a lot of them out there and there's a lot to weed through to get to the good ones, of course. But if you know what to look for and you know the right stories, then then um, you, know, you can buy very good, successful businesses that have a lot of upside and very little downside. And there's um, there's a huge trend right now of kind of reshoring manufacturing after kind of the, you know, what everybody lived through during the supply chain disruptions uh, a couple of years ago. We're buying businesses that have really strong balance sheets, but also really strong incomes, right? So targeting like one to 3 million for, for most of the portfolio is really kind of where we're at. And how's that? And then, so basically the tax benefit is you're basically doing a, essentially a cost segregation study. Am I, am I thinking about that right? Or so that we, we will use cost seg on any of the real estate assets that we own, but the, the, the real tax benefits on these businesses are going to come from the exit strategy. So we might buy, like I said, two to five companies um, and kind of meld them together into to, to one company. So you're naturally going to get some cost control, right? Because if I'm buying, you know, three, four, five companies that are all in similar fields, have kind of tangential businesses, maybe they have some client overlaps. I'm going to reduce overhead on IT and finance and HR and all of those natural cost savings that you get from consolidation. That's going to go straight to the bottom line. 
but then I'm also going from a company doing one or one and a half million of EBITDA to, uh, you know, uh, a diversified group of companies that's doing four, five, six, seven million of EBITDA. So, so when I get the multiplier up. Yeah. So when I go to exit that, I'm going to get a higher multiple on the back end is, is kind of the thesis. And, and we've seen that um, pretty consistently in the marketplace. Got it. So it's, and, it's less about tax savings for that strategy. <clears throat> well, like a private equity play. The ta- it, it is a traditional private equity strategy, but the exit is a little bit unique. What we're doing on the exit is a tax play. So we're going to actually sell the business back to the employees through what's called an ESOP, an employee stock ownership plan. So at, at the omnibus bill, um, part of the Secure Act 2.0, they had the, you know Congress set aside a, a budget to, to really start um, kind of pushing this agenda of transferring equity to employees more, right? So ESOPs have been around for a long, long time. They've been used very success, sex, successfully by companies like Wawa. Wawa is an ESOP company. Um, and uh, really what you're doing is, is you're, um, you're, you're, you're selling 100% of the company to the employee's retirement plan so that the company becomes tax exempt. And so the banks and insurance companies, they come in and they finance that as kind of like a leveraged ESOP, right? But what, what, what happens for our investors is each investor individually gets to make their own election of, of what's called a 1042. And you guys obviously know a 1031 in real estate where you exchange and defer the tax. 1042 is the same thing, but when you sell your company to an ESOP, the replacement property isn't another private company, it's any US stock or bond, right? So you you got an investor who puts in a hundred grand. Let's say we take 50 of that hundred grand and we go buy these businesses. And let's just for the sake of this conversation, say we double the exit value, right? So we go from 50 grand to a hundred grand on the exit, coming back to the investor. They can pay zero taxes on that hundred grand if they simply take it and put it into a brokerage account and buy U.S. stocks or bonds. And, And there's no definitive timeline. They can defer that until death and get a step up in basis. So is that, that's, that's all coupled into this one fund you're doing? Yes, correct. So it'll be a mix. So it, will it be two and a half times the tax write-off right away, or will it be a mix of these two different tax kind of? No, so, so you'll get your two and a half to one maximum deduction. We won't go over that. Um, but you're going to have some other assets that you own inside of the fund and, and, you know, whether they're paid for with cash or some combination of cash and debt, like you suggested, um, we're going to generate as much income in the fund as we can to our investors. Got and, and Got so, so much- there could be some additional down the road, basically these like manufacturing tax breaks that allow you to get the money back essentially tax-free. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so we, you know, we want to take advantage of, you know, everything we can. So like you, you suggested cost egg, that's a great way to, to drive, you know, tax benefits. The manufacturing companies are going to be eligible for a lot of R&D credits. Um, if we put renewable energy on the buildings, we'll get a lot of renewable energy ITC credits that we can pass through to offset some of the operating income. Um, so we pretty much look at everything we can do to in- enhance the value of the portfolio, uh, whether it's real estate or businesses, you know, where we have a pretty sophisticated approach in all of that. But, but it's, it's really at the end of the day, you know, we're going to provide, you know, assets, you, you know, we're taking your tax dollars, number one, and we're providing you income producing assets that, that we believe are going to, going to appreciate nicely. Okay. And then we're going to do everything we can over that five and a half year hold period to mitigate our taxes and, and make sure that, that we're being as tax efficient as we can with operating these, these assets. Cool. Cool guys. Well, um, uh, I'm sure I'll send you some emails and more, more questions, but I really appreciate you joining. And um, well, love to hear more about your in-person events. I'd be happy to come out and, and, and speak and, and, and meet any of your, you know, um, partners that you got out there. Oh, hey, how, how should people yeah. contact you? We, uh, oh yeah, great. Um, so <clears throat> you can either go to the website or uh, we, we can um, uh, just, you know, we have uh, investors at arclp.fund is, is our uh, investor email box, which gets monitored uh, by, by the whole team. 
So we have about a seven person uh, capital markets team headed by uh, Zach Murphy, who's our president of capital markets. And uh, Zach's actually on his honeymoon right now. But um, so investors at arclp.fund. And, um, you know, we, we also uh, have the ability for anybody to just go to the website and get access to the investor portal. It is a 506C, so it's a public offering. Awesome, guys. Hey, have a great, have a great uh, weekend. You too, Chad. Thanks. Great to meet you. Thanks for listening to this edition of the Real Estate Hackers Show. If you've not yet become a member of Real Estate Hackers, you can do that for free at realestatehackers.com. Get access to all the amazing real estate hacker deals from incredible vendors on a ton of content and materials for you, the investor. You can follow Real Estate Hackers on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. If you can give us a five-star review for the podcast, I would personally really appreciate it. We read every review and thank you so much for helping us grow this community for you, the real estate investor.